From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Jimmy, I you notice in the court how they have turned all of my journalistic contributions and quotations to international reporters and channels into accusations. Yemen, this is a place where the young journalist becomes successful. He is considered with suspicion. Jailed reporter Abdulayla Haider Shaya. Why is President Obama keeping a journalist in prison in Yemen? That's the title of an article in The Nation magazine. We'll speak to its author, Jeremy Scahill, just back from Yemen, and with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Then Big Labor endorses President Obama. We agree all across SEIU that we need to stand for a 99 percent agenda and re-elect our president, Barack Obama. We'll host a debate between labor journalist Mike Elk and Arthur Chaliotis, president of Local 1180, Communication Workers of America. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The U.S. soldier accused in the massacre of 16 Afghan civilians has been flown out of Afghanistan to a detention center in Kuwait. A senior U.S. commander said the move was made to help ensure a proper investigation and trial. The suspected killer's name has not been released, but he's been identified as a 38-year-old staff sergeant who served three tours of duty in Iraq, where he suffered a head injury. Afghan lawmakers and residents expressed anger over his exit, saying the soldier should be tried in Afghanistan. The U.S. soldier must be tried in Kandahar City. Why was he taken away from Afghanistan when he murdered innocent people in this country? He is transferred to another place to be freed. Why did he murder 16 people here? For what reason did he massacre them? We want to see him punished here in Afghanistan. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, meanwhile, continues a visit to Afghanistan in a bid to contain the fallout over the massacre. On Wednesday, Panetta received a security scare after an Afghan man drove a stolen pickup truck onto the tarmac where Panetta's plane was about to land, then emerged from the vehicle in flames. The man later died from the burns. A U.S. commander said he believed the incident was unrelated to Panetta's visit and that the man may have been trying to run the truck into a group of U.S. Marines. At a U.S. base in Helmand province, Panetta tried to highlight security gains under the U.S. occupation. This area was a Taliban stronghold uh, once upon a time, and now uh, a great deal of progress has been made uh, in, in terms of uh, Afghan security and Afghan governance in this area. Syrians are marking the first anniversary today of their uprising against the government of President Bashar al-Assad. The anniversary comes amidst an intensified push by Assad's forces to crush opposition pockets in northern and southern areas. Government forces have launched new attacks in the towns of Idlib, as well as in Dara, the site of the first major protests a year ago. On Wednesday, Syrian forces reportedly sprayed buildings in Dara with machine gun fire while conducting house-to-house -house raids. The Guardian newspaper has obtained what appears to be a trove of more than 3,000 emails downloaded from the private accounts of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and his wife, Asma. The emails show Assad took advice from Iran or its proxies on ways to handle the uprising against him, as well as mocking the reforms he promised to put in place in response. They also show Assad was briefed in detail about the presence of Western journalists in the Baba Amr area of Homs. The emails, which were intercepted by opposition activists, include messages from a daughter of the emir of Qatar advising the Assads to leave Syria and perhaps find exile in Doha. They show Assad's wife spending thousands of dollars in online purchases, while Assad skirted U.S. sanctions by buying music from iTunes. The Syrian leader also forwarded a link to a YouTube video that used toys and biscuits to reenact the siege of humps. The U.N. estimates more than 8,000 people have died in Assad's crackdown against the year-long uprising. President Obama is warning Iran that the window for a diplomatic resolution to the standoff over Iran's alleged nuclear activities is shrinking. Obama made the comment during a news conference with British Prime Minister David Cameron. In the past, there has been a tendency uh, for Iran in these negotiations with the P5-plus-1 to delay, to stall, uh, to do a lot of talking, but not actually move the ball forward. Uh, 
I think they should understand that uh, because the international community has applied so many sanctions, because uh, we have uh, employed uh, so many uh, of the options that are available to us to persuade Iran to take a different course, uh, that the window for solving this issue diplomatically is shrinking. A so-called free trade deal between the United States and South Korea goes into effect today, following its ratification last year. The deal is the largest trade agreement the U.S. has signed since the North American Free Trade Agreement with Canada and Mexico in 1994. It's been opposed by numerous labor unions and watchdog groups in the United States. According to Public Citizen, the deal is projected to cost 160,000 American jobs. South Korean farmers and some workers also oppose it, saying it threatens their livelihoods. As the deal came into effect, hundreds of people held a protest in the South Korean capital of Seoul. We want to abolish the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, which will go into effect tonight. It's a deal inflicting a loss on our country. Also, the deal is unfair, since it's under American law and above our domestic law. In other South Korean news, demolitions have begun to prepare construction of a naval base on Jeju Island, a UNESCO World Natural Heritage Site in South Korea. The South Korean Navy and Samsung Corporation are dynamiting the coastline with 400,000 tons of explosives. Local villagers have been fighting the construction for the past five years. This week in New York, activists held a protest outside the South Korean consulate that included a mock funeral procession for Jeju Island's marine life. We've been trying to meet with them, actually, for weeks, and they've denied a meeting, and so we decided we've used all the means at hand. We should just come here. And instead of just bringing ourselves, we actually brought the sea life of Jeju Island, which is currently being threatened with construction by a naval base. Allies from all around New York, including Occupy Wall Street, including the Raging Grannies, um, Filipino organizations, and Korean peace organizations all gathered here. And we, we really wanted to, in, in essence, hold a kind of funeral ceremony protest to mourn the loss of life and to show the South Korean consulate that we were not going to be stopped. A Ugandan LGBTQ rights group has filed a lawsuit in U.S. federal court against a Massachusetts-based evangelist who allegedly, uh, for allegedly inciting the persecution of gay men and lesbians in Uganda. The evangelist, Scott Lively, is accused of collaborating with Ugandan politicians and religious leaders to foment homophobia against Uganda's gay and lesbian communities. Lively said to have helped bring forth a parliamentary measure that called for the execution of homosexuals and later for their life imprisonment. Lively is one of a number of U.S. evangelicals tied to anti-LGBTQ fervor in Uganda. Financial giant Goldman Sachs took a hit Wednesday after a mid-level executive published a scathing resignation letter in The New York Times decrying the firm's, quote, toxic environment. In the letter, Greg Smith, the former Goldman executive director who worked in London, said bosses at the firm called their clients muppets and strove to maximize profits at the expense of client interests. He writes, quote, it makes me ill how callously people talk about ripping their clients off. In New York City, dozens of people rallied outside the Waldorf Astoria Hotel on Wednesday to protest a fundraiser for Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney. I lived in Massachusetts when he was governor, and I can tell you that our biggest um, sign for, for Romney was a flip-flop. He's the biggest flip-flopper. He'll say whatever the audience wants to hear and then he does whatever he wants to do. And the first thing he did in Massachusetts was to eliminate bilingual education and trash teachers. Adopting the language of Occupy Wall Street, a satirical group calling themselves 1 percent for Mitt, offered a mock defense of Romney's candidacy. I'm here today to, uh, you know, tell these hippies that they should buy their own politicians. That's the American way. Uh, you know, there's no gratitude here for the Wall Street executives, the billionaires who are financing our election. Some countries can't even hold elections. You know, I think a little gratitude is in order.
Some of my one percenter friends are here to tell these hippies what's up, and uh, I'm hoping that there's not a clash. But I think in the marketplace of ideas, uh, you know, we've shown that that uh, the one percenters will always prevail, whether it's uh, Mitt Romney or Barack Obama in 2012. Uh, the system is rigged for us. It's class war, and we're winning. And a New York City corruption case exposed by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in the New York Daily News has led to a major fine for the main contractor involved. Science Applications International Corporation has agreed to pay $500 million in penalties for the scandal surrounding the computerized payroll system called CityTime. The CityTime fraud cost New York City taxpayers more than $80 million. This is Democracy Now! And those are the headlines. DemocracyNow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. So, Juan, it's you who exposed the story, and you wrote yet another column in the New York Daily News today about City Time and SAIC, one of the largest military contractors in the world. Yeah, there was an astonishing press conference that was held uh, uh, yesterday by the U.S. attorney uh, for the Southern District, uh, Preet Bharara, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, and the Commissioner of Investigations, announcing this uh, settlement with uh, SAIC, one of the largest defense contractors in the country, basically to prevent uh, SAIC from actually facing criminal charges. Uh, uh, the company agreed to pay uh, $500 million. It's the largest recovery uh, of a uh, by a local government or a state government in the history of the United States. What did they do? Uh, well, they were engaged in a massive scheme of uh, paying kickbacks uh, to uh, city uh, uh, consultants uh, and also inflating bills over a 10-year period for a payroll system that started out at $70 million and ended up costing $700 million. Uh, and it was all basically people being paid $400,000, $500,000 a year uh, to delay and delay the creation of a payroll system for the city of New York. Uh, and uh, after uh, I started writing articles, in late uh, 2009, early 2010, by the December of 2010, the U.S. attorney uh, indicted a bunch of people. It's now 11 people have been indicted on a variety of, of fraud and uh, uh, money laundering because they were setting up shell companies and accounts uh, all, all around the world to funnel all this money. Uh, two people fled to India. Uh, they are now uh, fugitives uh, in India, and two have pleaded guilty. So it's a massive uh, corruption scandal uh, that occurred all on under the watch of the Bloomberg administration without anyone in the government apparently knowing anything about it. Uh, but the investigation is continuing to see whether any city officials are actually involved directly uh, in the cover-up. So, but SAIC not only agreed to pay $500 million, they agreed to accept a federal monitor of the company for the next three years, all in an effort to save uh, billions of dollars in contracts. Ninety percent of their work is with government agencies around the country. So if they were convicted of criminal charges, the company itself, uh, they would have been banned from being able to get any other kind of co public contracts in the future. So for the company, it's like in Monopoly. You pay $50 to get out of jail. They've paid $500 million uh, to stay out of jail uh, and to save all the rest of their contracting work. Well, congratulations on your remarkable expose that has really ultimately led to this.